It's a great pleasure to be here, uh, especially on a 10th birthday. Um, do you want to bring the lights down perhaps a little? It will come as no surprise if I tell you that having practiced as an architect for more than 50 years, I'm absolutely passionate about buildings. But I have to say that beyond architecture, I truly believe infrastructure is more important. It's the very pavement that we tread. It's the parks, the streets, the squares, the boulevards, it's the bridges, it's the airports, the connections. It's about our everyday life. And in that sense, I would describe it as the urban glue which binds the individual buildings together. And the quality of that infrastructure really determines the quality of our lives, even though, as Churchill said, when he talks about buildings, they shape our lives. I suggest that it's that amalgam of the buildings and the infrastructure together. It's inseparable from the economic prosperity. The infrastructure is totally tied to that. So it's about not only physical well-being, it's about economic, material well-being. And because cities are driven by energy and energy is connected to issues of pollution, climate change, then that is a key factor. All of these things are interwined together. So how do we separate them out? It's very difficult, but if we separate out that pollution issue and we say it's related to energy, then the energy in buildings and the infrastructure which connects the movement of people and goods between those buildings accounts for 75% of the energy consumed in an industrialized society. If we were quite simplistic and said hybrids in between, but the polarities, there's the pedestrian friendly city like London here, New York on the left, and there's a relatively recent city which is car dependent. You can't move around unless you get in and out of a car and all that follows from that. Little diversion, looking at Central Park here, if you go very, very close to this image, you really cannot find a shortcut from the east side to the west side. And this is an image, for me, is a reminder of the genius of Olmsted, the architect, or the landscape architect, with the architect Vaux, um, and the social principles behind this. They were not looking when they invested in infrastructure. They were not looking to deliver something that would be appropriate for the end of the project. They were looking far, far ahead. They were looking generations ahead. At the time that this was conceived, it was horse and carts under that bridge and sheep grazing on the land above. And that, as an extraordinary foresight, really long-term design thinking. But to return to those two polarities, the pedestrian-friendly, walkable city, exemplified by London, by New York, Hong Kong. If we compare that with the kind of ribbon of motorways which could have been an Atlantic, could have been Los Angeles, Houston, um, let's take Atlanta. You look at the comparative populations. This is the footprint, this is the shape of the city. And the shape of the city is very, very important in terms of its performance and its attraction. Atlanta. London and New York are about one and a half times the population of Atlanta. And they can, their, their carbon footprint is one sixth. If you take Hong Kong, similar population comparison, the factor is almost one to 20. So another way of looking at cities three dimensionally, and I'm indebted to Ricky Urban Age LSE for these diagrams, is if you three-dimensionally look at where people live in New York, you can see, compared to the density of the work locations, you can see that some people are coming in. If you look at the similar three-dimensional diagram for London, you see that a lot of people are coming in. That is, in a way, one signal telling you something we all know 
and that is that there is a housing problem in London. There is another issue here, and that is that although these are very kind of diagrammatic, you can imagine if it's Manhattan, and if you were close, you would see the peninsula of Manhattan. And Manhattan is probably embedded in New York in a larger sense. Manhattan is even more sustainable because as you move out of New York, it really starts to sprawl. And you have this kind of, for me, a kind of visual social blight. It drains the life out of the, uh, the centers. And it's kind of endless. And if this is America, you only have to cross the channel to see the continental equivalent of that in France, Italy, Switzerland. Um, and it really is very, very unpleasant. And I think that. For me, one of the most enlightened acts of, um, of Parliament was the Town and Country Planning Act of 1947, which created this unique, extraordinary concept of a green belt, which is always under threat. And forever one hears the mantra, you have to erode the green belt because that's the only way of solving the housing situation in our cities. Um, Bill Bryson did a, a book recently, um, and I think it's called The Road to Little Dribbling, and he's an American living in East Anglia, and, uh, and he writes so movingly about why it's important to maintain the green belt, and he writes that as an American. Um, if you look at London enclosed by the green belt, which is one of the factors which makes it so desirable as a place to live because you have this green lung, so close, and in a way it also is, it has ensured that, that London has a greater sustainability in terms of keeping its compactness. But in, in there, there are already 32 square kilometers of brownfield sites ready for uh, development. If you take a population increase in the next 25 years, then that would lead you to a need for another, another 123 square kilometers. If you built at the density of Chelsea, and I think it's interesting to talk just a little about densities. In other words, the number of people on an acre or a square kilometer. Um, and London, interestingly, after World War II, the expectation is that London would actually shrink. So you had this phenomena of the new towns anticipating that. And so the density, if you take Southwark um, around the turn of the century and running through until after World War II was around that density, 20 and a half thousand people to the square kilometer. And then you had a lot of developments of social housing at much lower densities and that is one of the explanations for why the density of London over, historically over that period has dropped in the centre and increased on the outside. There are current trends that are slightly countering that, but that's the broad picture. And the immediate reaction is that's a higher density than that. But when you compare it, you realise that that's an untruth, that you don't have to build high to have a high density. So if we put this in the context of London, and you say, what are the most desirable, most sought after areas, the high real estate, then you have, you, you take Earl's Court, which is 20,000, you take Notting Hill, take Mayfair, you take Chelsea. So the opportunity in the center of London to take not only the brownfield size, but to take those areas which were redeveloped to retrofit some of those tower buildings, higher six, seven story buildings, and to use the space around them and to create more community-like spaces to increase the density, to bring the density up to, and the factor I used was Chelsea, because in a way it's low rise, it's very friendly, you can walk to a shop, you can walk to a cinema, entertainment, uh, leisure. It's very pedestrian friendly. And that could be, by a policy, made available and you would have 
you would, you would satisfy the housing market with a, with a spectrum of, of, of houses that would be affordable to all sectors of society. If you look at that relationship as a graph between the very, very high density uh, cities, um, Hong Kong, New York, Singapore, you move across to here, and then you shoot up there, the energy consumption goes absolutely crazy, um, and all of these have the characteristics of a kind of rich mixture of uses. Good public transport, they're pedestrian friendly, they're high density, as I've said, they're socially diverse, and that's the opportunity of these estates for redevelopment, uh, and they have very, very good public spaces. In the case of London, very different as its pattern uh, from New York, um, a, a, a kind of uh, a, a way number of villages, each with their own green area, have kind of uh, molded together. But it, if you move it outside of the world of architecture, professionals, and you say, well, the voting, visitors, public, residents, how do they see it? So P PWC, they do this scan of 30 cities, and they have 59 indicators. And it's quite interesting that London and New York, they come out on top. Singapore comes number three, uh, and Hong Kong over there comes number 12. So that kind of model of a city has a, a much wider, broader uh, appeal. Um, if we just focus on London and explore one small concept, and that is the potential of a, uh, a small change to make a very, very large difference. And it's interesting that we have quite short memories of how things were in the past. And I can recall in 1996, Ricky and I were on a platform, Tony Blair in that, it was arranged with the Evening Standard. The Evening Standard put its kind of influence behind it. Um, and I was advocating the case, I visited this recently, and I said, you know, this is one of the most noble spaces in Europe, and it's absolutely disgusting. It's full of cars. And I did a sketch up there demonstrating and saying, you know, this could be one of the greatest spaces in Europe. And with the kind of clout of the Evening Standard and the politicians who were at that event, that eventually happened. And um, it's a kind of total transformation. The next two, I kind of had a long conversation about whether I should show it or not, because I thought everybody's familiar with this, but maybe they're not. I mean, 1996, this is how Trafalgar Square was. And again, I think we all have quite short memories. It was a huge undertaking to transform that to this. I mean, it was a nation, it was kind of, not quite nationwide, but right to the edges of the metropolis, and, and involved about 180 separate organizations. But again, this is how it was here, and the center was for the kind of pigeons and uh, stragglers on the edge, and, um, and again, that, uh, that transformation. So it is just worth remembering uh, the power of a relatively small intervention. And, um, and just inserting a bridge, a pedestrian bridge uh, across the Thames, the Millennium Bridge, that has had a socially transforming effect way beyond the scope of the undertaking itself. And against McKinsey's predictions at the time, all their predictions were wrong by a factor of 100%. This is the space, <laughs> this is the space syntax uh, kind of diagram of how it was without the bridge. And then this is the prediction of the greater connectivity. And uh, so they predicted 4 million people walking across it every year, 8 million walked across it. They said 1,500 jobs, it was 3,000 jobs. Um, uh, attendance in St. Paul's of visitors was up by 40%, and similarly, uh, the Tate Gallery. So, again, the ripple effect of a relatively uh, small intervention. Thinking big, because I think that the answer is probably the two uh, approaches in parallel. I wonder just how many people, when they walk along here and they see the workmen putting in the kind of Boris Bikeway, the one billion pound sort of transforming initiative into London, adding yet another layer onto the tarmac here. I just wonder how many of us 
are aware and grateful uh, to a guy called uh, Bazalgette, um, who had uh, this extraordinary vision to use the solution to the health problems of London at that time by the big initiative of creating a sewer system. But he didn't just create a sewer system. He integrated it into great sort of civic gestures of lamp standards, incredible detailing of stone, underground transportation, uh, landscaping, pumping stations. And all that was occasioned by the fact that the Thames was really an open sewer. And the stink was literally so disgusting that Parliament passed this bill. So again, the power of an act of Parliament, the power, uh, the political dimension to infrastructure. And amazingly, we talk about the problems of building an airport is going to take us 20, 30 years. This guy did it in seven years. The whole thing, well, not the whole thing, he did an eastern expansion that took another 10 years. But essentially, the big initiative was achieved in seven years. It's very interesting, we talk about pollution, we associate it with, with, with Beijing. It wasn't that long ago that we had the great smog in London, and we had a 30-mile band. Uh, that brought the whole city to a standstill. And then we had the Clean Air, Act, Clean Air Act of 1956, and you can see that dramatic uh, reduction. Again, um, short memories, but big initiatives. Um, and so when we see this image of Beijing, it's not really that long ago that we were having the same problems here. And um, Peter Drayson, uh, has come up with this very, very, um, uh, Paul Drayson, excuse me, has come up with this very, very interesting app. Um, and his proposition is that the catalyst for change, perhaps in the same way that we're seeing Uber transform the whole uh, transport uh, taxi relationship in a city, his point was when you can see exactly where you are, exactly what the level of pollution is, that will move you to participate and really uh, bring change about, which I think is a very, very interesting phenomenon. Ricky talked about the urban explosion in China, where uh, it's the equivalent of one London every six months for six years, starting uh, last year. And in that sense, uh, what does China learn, perhaps, from some of the uh, successes, uh, the mix of positive and negative in terms of our urban models. How do they uh, apply that experience? Um, from some recent uh, exchanges, I, I see some quite positive indicators, but this nonetheless is, is some of the uh, present realities. But on the other hand, what can we learn from uh, some of the achievements. And, um, and this I'm quite closely connected to, it's Beijing Airport. The thing here is it's not just the quest on their part to find a building as a machine that will just cope with the number of aircraft arriving and departing. There is a tremendous sense of civic pride. And I started my working life at the age of 16 in Manchester Town Hall. And I tell you, that made a deep impression on me. That was a great kind of initiative with super civic pride, with Albert Square in front of it. They, in a way, have picked up that. And, um, and I fear sometimes that we're in danger of losing that if we haven't lost it. And just make a comparison about decision making and a clear kind of view of where you want to go as a society. Make a comparison. This building, which is one, nearly one and a half million uh, square meters, and needed 44 kilometers of road and rail to connect it to the center, took four years. And you compare that with Terminal 5. Now, it's usually at this point that somebody says, ah, well, but you don't understand. They have a one-party system. They don't have unions. Um, that explains it all. Well, sorry, it doesn't, because if you take the longest-running inquiry in planning history in this country, and you take four years, 
and you take the longest planning process, and it's three to four years, you're still left with a, an embarrassing gap in between, which is totally about decision making. It's totally about deciding where you want to go and going there in the most economical, expeditious way uh, possible. So I think that, that that's one of the lessons that I see uh, that we could learn. Another is how did Hong Kong learn from the past history of our airports? So they have a, a problem as they see aircraft kind of landing and there are all these cartoon images of the aircraft pl plucking the washing off the apartment balconies as it sort of comes in low over the, over the city. So they decide they have to move the airport, but there's no land. That's not a problem. They just take an island, chop down the mountain, it's 100 meters high, and then just create a site out of water. No big deal. Um, where did they get the idea from? Probably from us. I mean, in 1971, we were talking about doing it in Maplin Sands, Goodwin Sands, Britannia. So, and, um, and everybody knows that we're on that bandwagon with the, uh, with the Thames hub. And it's probably worth just perhaps putting that in context. If you take the Thames hub airport, you need 57 kilometers of road and rail, and you need to add a little bit of land into the water. But that is too difficult. I hear it all the time, it's just too difficult. But compare it with Hong Kong. They had to do more roads and rail. They had to do tunnels for road and rail. They had to build two bridges, two kilometers there, two kilometers there. And it was all achieved in three years, in six years. In actual fact, it was three years to make the site, because it didn't exist, and three years to make the building. Um, and, um, and in terms of proximity, if you look at a hub airport and you look at connecting it by HS1, you get to the centre in 30 minutes. Currently, Heathrow to Farrington is 47 minutes. When you've got Crossrail, it's still 32 minutes. So in time, there's kind of two minutes difference and it's, and it's faster. And also, at this point, you're using this airport as a catalyst to create a new Thames barrier to use tidal power, which will drive the airport, and also to secure the eastward expansion of London to take into account that growth to add more land to the land stock for expansion. Um, so this really is a very interesting choice, isn't it? You can spend 14 years and you can get an airport which will cater beyond the end of this one here, operating at 85% utilization, or you can spend the same amount of time, get one runway extra, a small one, and, uh, and you don't achieve the same objective. And the reality is that Heathrow can never be a hub. It's simply not big enough. It's not big enough. The imprint is just, it won't work. It'll never be a hub. So it's like a stationary bicycle. The harder you pedal, you're not standing still, you're actually going backwards. So, um, but as you can see, I do have an opinion on the subject. <laughs> um, <laughs> the Hub Airport was a research project that we did because we were immersed, and still are, in all these kind of bold ventures and, uh, and thinking ahead whether it's now Mexico airport, other airports, other initiatives around the world. So we wanted to bring some of that back home and say, hey, look at this, think about it. And the airport was only one component of a kind of bigger picture. And that was saying that it's all about connectivity. And, and it's about connectivity by rail, it's about rebalancing the UK, and if you, if you do that, then you bring prosperity, you, you, you even out the inequalities, the differences, whether it's freight, whether it's taking it off the road, whether it's international freight, coordinating it with ports, um, and making connections and recognizing that we are an island. We're not in a European country where if there's a problem, we can cross a border, hop on, a, on an aircraft. 
but, but, but basically a hub airport will serve these places in the future. And these are places that as a practice we cannot get to out of Heathrow right now. Flights sometimes only once a week, so you have to connect in Europe where there's a daily flight. So anyway, that was, that was part of the thinking. Another part of the thinking was to try to communicate some of the benefits of high-speed rail. And I hear quite frequently, um, uh, why would you do high-speed rail so a businessman could save a few minutes getting from Manchester to London? It's not really about that. The experience in China is that 50% of the flights less than 500 kilometers are replaced by high speed. You double the capacity of re regional rail, you take freight off, uh, off the road, and you reduce congestion into the city centers. So the benefits are kind of far and wide. And also, why as a nation can we not celebrate the heritage of our great landscaping tradition? I mean, here, Capability Brown, you feel you own the whole kind of county. The reality is that this is your, your boundary, and that's th that device of a ha-ha that gives you the illusion that really the landscaping is just sort of beautiful. Why can't you apply that principle to the insertion of high-speed rail, connect it with other vital services which may need upgrading or introducing, um, to sink those, to dig in, to create berms, and to combine this with trails, bike trails, hiking trails. Why not celebrate this as a, as, as, as a great potential, a great opportunity? In other words, this, uh, in its time, the Glenfiddan uh, viaduct over the river in, in Scotland is, is, is a great addition to the landscape. Sometimes you just cannot bury it. You have to actually state it and live with it. And I think that, that in, in that case, the opportunity to be able to do something on this heroic scale, but very, very delicately in the landscape. And here in our Mio viaduct over the Tarn River, you can see the comparison with the Eiffel Tower just in terms of scale. These are 17 meters higher uh, than, the, than the tower. Could there ever be an ecological dimension to a motorway? It's an interesting question. Before the viaduct, this is what you had. You had 20 mile, five hour tailbacks. The, lo the roads were totally congested. It, it wreaked mayhem. Um, so if you take this and you put it in the sky on a viaduct, what are the, what are the benefits? Are there benefits? Obviously, benefits of convenience. How can you quantify it? Well. One in every 10 vehicles is a heavy goods vehicle. And unlike all the other vehicles, you do know where it started. It started in Paris and it's gone to Perpignan. And because of the recording devices, that can be calculated. And just taking the trucks alone, you can take 40,000 tons of carbon dioxide annually, which is the equivalent of, of planting a 40,000 tree forest, and that's just 10% of the vehicles. And also the idea that this could be celebratory, that it could be very, very delicate in the landscape, it could give you almost the feeling of flight as you went through, and become something that would in itself be an attraction. People would actually come, stay in the local town of Mio, enjoy the prospect of the bridge, be a, almost, as it is, a tourist attraction, as well as the, uh, the other benefits. I'd like to just touch on the, uh, some experience which I and my colleagues have had on many of our projects. And, um, and it's interesting that you need individuals who have courage, and who are committed to do social good, and who are elected and responsible to the people who have elected them. And if they don't see good things happening as a result of that, they don't get re-elected. And it's, I mean, Jean Bousquet was the individual who created the Carré d'Art in Nîmes, which has just now been renamed the Carré d'Art Jean Bousquet. Uh, Mauricio Macri, who we've been working with, uh, 
now president of, of Argentina, and very much influenced by the record of what he did for his city. So all these individuals, very, very important principle. If you take Macri, what he did, he identified zones in the city where they could um, encourage a certain kind of enterprise. So there's the sports zone, design, arts, technology. This is the one that we were involved with. And, um, and there's a key building as a catalyst. You can see the site for that key building up there, and you can see the adverts going in for the zone, um, uh, advertising office space. And the building that we were responsible for was the city hall. And what is interesting about this is that the photographer taking this photograph at the start of this project, when our team first went out on the site, it was a no-go area. You couldn't walk around. It was that <coughs> dangerous. That has totally transformed. There are other factors, of course, there's a public transport system, so people can walk easily uh, to here. And connectivity and communication is a major factor in terms of social change. <coughs> and then, uh, working with Pascal Marigal, um, he was under intense pressure from competing empires of the communication world. And, um, and this is, um, this is a, a hill which is probably has the highest proportion of lawyers um, in Barcelona. So he had a really, really tough time. But he convinced everybody that, they, that the rival enterprises should get together and they should share one tower. And this was the resulting tower. The effect of that is extraordinarily economical, but it was an act of great political courage. It's the same story in terms of uh, Bilbao and the metro, which, which set the city up for, uh, for the, uh, the, 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 the Geary Guggenheim uh, enterprise. And this is seeing how it was locked in its kind of industrial past and the way in which the administration has encouraged uh, enterprise and, um, and the metro system, again in terms of communication, the kind of economic generator. Another interesting uh, project is the High Line. So if you take this kind of disused, elevated railway uh, system in New York, and this is the view afterwards. I mean, a great uh, initiative. Um, inspired under the leadership of Mike Bloomberg uh, as a mayor. And, um, and that th connects buildings, brings um, redevelopment uh, along its spine. And um, wasn't exactly the inspiration, but is, is, is quite a, a, a very relevant model to the idea of Sky Cycle, which uh, we proposed along with a partner's exterior architecture and space syntax. The idea of um, an above-ground initiative that wouldn't require all the heavy drilling and excavation would be quite lightweight, could encourage kiosks, and through its connectivity would, would, would bring about another phase of urban uh, renewal. Again, the initiative of a, a, a kind of small change with the power to make a big, uh, big difference. I've been talking about projects, really, in this part of the world here. You might call it the ordered world. This is Caracas, and it is this motorway spine that separates the other informal world. Uh, the differences are fairly obvious. On the right-hand side, you'll have a bathroom. Here, you won't. There, you'll be able to press a switch and have electricity. Here, you won't. Um, sanitation, clean water, and so on. Um, and uh, some projects in that part of the world, and one which uh, we've already heard about in the introduction earlier, uh, Bogota, this uh, brilliant uh, manifesto of doing more with less, and the statistics, just look at them. Uh, since this um, innovation, 93% reduction in traffic fatalities, and so on. So really, for the same price, as a 40-kilometer metro system, this mayor achieved with this idea a network of 400 kilometers, I mean, and, and transforming in its effect. 
and using existing technology, but rethinking it, um, giving it its own dedicated route. The people who will be sitting in there will have bought their tickets before they even got to the, uh, to the bus line. And then in uh, Medellin, uh, the uh, transfer technology of this, which is arguably the most economical way, I think it's something like uh, 30 to $100 um, a mile, inserting that into the informal settlements and um, I think that he, the mayor called this initiative uh, social urbanism. The idea being that he targeted the poorest in the society to improve their communication and link it to a program of educational buildings. Rather like uh, other images in this series, the one that I showed which had the different densities of the cities, this image and some of the others I'm indebted to Ricky and his colleagues for. Uh, so I haven't seen this myself and I can't wait to see it, but I think it's very much an inspirational example. And, um, and again, it was a very, very specific initiative to uh, encourage young architects to link it to education. And the, you can measure the social effects of this because if your kids can go to school or can move uh, across areas safely, uh, without coming into contact with the gangs and the drug dealers, then that's going to reduce uh, homicides. And this speaks wonders. I mean, when, uh, when this guy came in, the murder rate went down 25%, and that's something like 10% compared with where it was in 1991. So infrastructure does have the power for quite transformative change. This is another example I'm indebted to Ricky I think is absolutely brilliant. I haven't met the architect. I'm looking forward to meeting him. Um, and this is the upper deck of, um, of a project which took the 300 public toilets. It was commissioned by the Dwellers Association. And, um, and instead of doing what everybody expected, you put public toilets in, well, it's about sanitation and waste, isn't it? But here is the same holistic thinking as Bazalgette. No, it's not just about toilets. It's about spaces for kids where they can learn at night safely. Uh, it's about gender, it's about risk. Uh, the photovoltaics on the roof enable this area and that area there to be lit at night, so it's about safety. So it is this kind of holistic thinking and the way in which a small intervention can make a big change. A couple of uh, just touching on what I would call research projects. Um, and, um, and this, we were approached to look at a project in Daravi, an informal settlement. It's about the same size as, uh, as Hyde Park. It's a million people. That's the density per hectare. That's the space per family. Um, and, um, and this team, uh, Narinda uh, Sagu, my partner, and my partner, Chris Bubb, uh, went out there and, uh, and spent time with the community and tried to ask the right questions about what makes the place tick. And in the process of doing that, they also said, you know, these buildings here, well, these buildings here were built as an answer to that. Why do they lie empty? Why do they have the only modern sanitation in the entire community, and yet they're, they're unused? So that was one of the questions that they asked. And um, this is just a glimpse of a very big dossier of, uh, of work, where examining the cross-section, you can't, th th this runs the waste economy of Mumbai, and, uh, and it needs horizontal space. You can't make it work in a 14-story building. So some of the explorations were, could you, without ripping the community apart, without bulldozing it and resettling everybody in remote locations, which is the conventional answer, could you take the physical and social infrastructure of the community and insert modern services? That meant trying to find out what was happening behind uh, the walls, what kind of spaces. Could you transform that? Could you use the power of photovoltaics to take it off a, a grid which is subject to frequent breakdowns? And in a glimpse, another research project, Mazdar Institute, um, the kind of leading um, 
institution for researching green uh, forms of energy, renewable energy, and investing in green uh, initiatives. That is currently about 5,000 people by about 2030. It will be 50, 60,000 uh, anticipated. And all these lights are blazing here, totally driven. It is still, um, so many years later, it's still the only functioning zero carbon uh, community. And it is driven primarily by that 10 megawatt solar field. Those are conventional photovoltaics. In this project, there were a number of separate experiments. One was concentrated power, looking at the ability of the sun to be beamed into a trough of uh, a kind of parabolic trough, which would then direct the sun's rays with great intensity onto that long, hollow tube of liquid, which would be heated to several hundred degrees centigrade and, um, and that would be converted through a turbine and produce electricity. And it is that same Mazda entity which has invested in the London Array, which is the world's largest uh, wind farm. And it's quite interesting just to see the, the potential in terms of the way that those could power and will power uh, communities. So I think that's a, a kind of interesting initiative. Um, Moving to the Africa that we heard about before, there are 54 countries in Africa. It's the second largest continent. Its population is 1.2 billion. By 2050, that will have doubled. And at that point, one in four people on the planet will be African. And the 44 of those countries use the same energy as, as Spain. So how will its infrastructure catch up? And what are the urgent issues? Um, I was approached by uh, somebody I've known for some years, Jonathan Ledgard, who had the idea that maybe you could solve some of the humanitarian problems. Jonathan is an African expert. He's lived for many years of his life in Africa. He's passionate about the country. And, um, and he says, you know, one of the problems is how you deliver blood. Blood is a kind of vital ingredient in terms of sickness and disease in Africa. And, um, and he tells harrowing stories of hospitals he's visited, children who've not survived simply because the blood couldn't be delivered. And just to put the infrastructure needs of Africa into context, um, Narinda, uh, in an earlier venture of his when he went out to Sierra Leone uh, to use drawing to try to help kids who'd been traumatized by, by the war. Um, so he took a little video of what an all-season road is. <laughs> this is Narinda getting to the school. So if you put that into the context of drones which are under development at the moment. Um, the one with a wingspan will deliver 20 transfusions. The larger one will deliver parts, bits of machinery, uh, equipment. Um, and this is the kind of all season road. Obviously if you leap ahead you could see drone highways in the sky and when the infrastructure catches up whether it's a road which also kind of harnesses uh, the sun's power and converts it, whatever. But meanwhile, um, at the scale of three drone ports in Rwanda, uh, where Jonathan has been negotiating, and the idea of a building system which is derived from our work with the European Space Agency on, uh, on lunar structures, and so a self-build uh, project for the architecture coupled with the technology of the, um, of the drone. Now, when Jonathan approached me, he said, Norman, you've been involved with some of the largest airports in the world. How do you feel about doing the smallest one in the world? <laughs> and of course, I was excited, moved, um, and he pointed out, of course, what will happen is if this really takes off, there'll be so many of them that in mass it will be greater 
than your kind of big airports. But the interesting thing about doing airports is that I'm often asked, but can an airport ever be sustainable? And, um, and I've been thinking about an answer. And maybe you have to put that question into a wider perspective. So just starting with the livestock industry. And the livestock industry generates as much uh, emissions, carbon emissions, as every aircraft, truck, train, bus, car, motorcycle, and ship together combined. So the greenhouse gas emissions from this industry equals the totality of that. You can quantify that in terms of greenhouse gases. What if you quantify it in the amount of fuel, fossil fuel, used to produce this? Just that. It's the equivalent of the combined passengers traveling 250 kilometers in the 747, or 30 kilometers in a family car. Thank you. <laughs>